Welcome to ACSM's 2020 Virtual Experience. I'm delighted to join Dr. Silvano Zanuso to bring you Technogym's industry-sponsored seminar today on the use of exercise equipment and prescriptions for disease and health. It's been an important ACSM partner in exercise as medicine. I'm Angela Smith, an orthopedic surgeon in Philadelphia. I'm a past president of the American College of Sports Medicine and a member of the Exercise as Medicine Advisory Board. I will begin our session together with brief background information on ACSM's Exercise as Medicine initiative. Silvano will then introduce the thoughtful and innovative design that Technogym is including in its equipment. He will describe the science that informs these designs. Next, Silvano and I will discuss how the equipment may be used in carrying out an Exercise as Medicine prescription. Also, Technogym is just completing its evidence-based booklet on specific populations and prescriptions for exercises for many common chronic conditions. Exercise as Medicine was founded in 2007 under the leadership of then ACSM President Bob Salas in partnership with the American Medical Association. This has become an ACSM signature initiative, but it's based on decades of research that shows that physical activity and exercise have a powerful effect on health. This is true in both the prevention and management of both many chronic diseases and many medical conditions. It's also true in lifestyle management. Exercise as medicine includes routine physical activity assessment and screening, some brief advice and counseling, and then a prescription for physical activity. The concept is that exercise as medicine really ties the physician or physician advisor, PA, nurse practitioner, and then combines them with the exercise professional to refer a patient to the appropriate physical activity resources. This connection is what is so key about the exercise as medicine initiative, the healthcare provider to the exercise professional, all playing an integral role as an extender from the healthcare prescription to the carrying out. Exercise as medicine is global now. There are actually 37 countries with exercise as medicine national centers. It's also campus-wide. Over 275 universities and colleges around the world have been seeking to advance the vision of exercise as medicine in their unique setting to increase physical activity of students and staff and faculty, but also to train new generations of healthcare providers and exercise professionals about exercise as medicine. There are action guides that help the healthcare provider understand what's happening from their prescription onward and to help the exercise professional understand how to carry out that prescription, but also then communicate back to the healthcare provider. There are action guides for those who want to improve their lifestyle. These include handouts for the client. There are also handouts for those who have these chronic disorders, and this goes for older adults as well as for teenagers and even younger children. These handouts include things such as type 2 diabetes, depression, anxiety, and high blood pressure. There are many, many more of these in both English and in Spanish so far. The concept of exercise as medicine is to create a partnership in physical activity. This is to provide programs, places, exercise professionals, and self-guided resources, including mobile apps and including programs such as the one you're going to hear about from Technogym to help carry out these important physical activity and other healthcare prescriptions on a regular basis. So exercise is truly medicine, and it's really remarkable to see how Technogym, with its innovative approach and wellness concepts, has managed to be a strong partner to this Exercise as Medicine initiative. Technogym has an almost 40-year history of innovations, from the first machines that were actually manufactured in a garage, to the current designs and machine abilities. These coordinate into a clinical program as part of a medical treatment plan or as a wellness program to optimize fitness. 
The Wellness Valley concept is really quite remarkable in my mind. The success of this has been so amazing and it's been evidenced by this 2019 report that I'm going to be talking about here. This report was completed by public groups who work together. The Wellness Valley is an initiative that aims to get this entire group going together really well, leveraging all parts of the beautiful Wellness Valley and Cesena, Italy area. It was launched in 2002 by Nero Alessandri, who's pictured here. Um, he's the president and founder of Technogym, and the concept is that it involves all the main stakeholders of Romagna, those who can enhance the quality of life and also enhance wellness. This project is promoted and coordinated by the Wellness Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization. This collaborates with governments, institutions, internationally, really all of the um, different institutions you would want to work with in this area, in this geographical area. It's the first example of a true wellness ecosystem, which is a social and cultural model that focuses on people and their health, and it creates the conditions that allow them to make healthy lifestyle choices. It really is including all the multiple stakeholders, the schools, the hospitals, the universities, even the hotels and the spas. And it's this group of not-for-profits as well as some for-profit organizations, but the nonprofits together put together this 2019 report. And I'm going to give you some of the figures that I thought were the most important figures that they found that changed Chazena in the positive direction of physical activity compared with what's going on national, nationally. For example, if you look at sedentary behavior, the national average for sedentary behavior is 28%, but in the Wellness Valley, only 13% of the Valley residents were so sedentary. Daily walking. Daily walking was reported by 51% of the Wellness Valley residents compared with 40% for the national average. Similarly, daily bicycle use was 29% in the Wellness Valley compared to 11% nationally, and the percentage of doctors prescribing physical exercise was 40% in the Wellness Valley area compared to 30% nationally. Finally, and to me most impressive, the population at risk of disability due to chronic disease, in other words, what we consider our really final outcome, was only about 10% in the Wellness Valley area compared with almost 21% nationally. This is really, really impressive in my mind. So these results pull together so many different things. A project that has begun in 2003 demonstrates that this model really can be an efficient system capable of promoting health and sustainability in the long-term period. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Silvano Sanuso. This is Silvano, and he's going to be presenting the science and some of the Technogym concepts. Dr. Silvano Zanuso is the medical and scientific director and research, science, sorry, scientific research director of Technogym, which is based in Cesena, Italy. He serves as visiting professor in the Faculty of Science at the University of Coventry. His primary scientific interest right now is the effect of physical activity and exercise in people with metabolic disorders. He received his undergraduate degree in exercise science from the University of Padua, his master's at the Manchester Metropolitan University, and his PhD in clinical exercise physiology at the European University, sorry, I'm speaking halfway in Spanish and Italian and halfway in English, at the Uni European University of Madrid. So Silvano, Please go ahead and tell us all about the science behind what Technogym is doing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Angela. And now it's my time to talk a little bit about the role of technology in the future of exercise medicine. So we have uh, uh, just uh, seen with Dr. Angela Schmidt that uh, 
we have just created, in collaboration with the, the ACSM, a booklet called a collection of evidence-based training programs that could be a valid aid in the identification of effective programs for the most common chronic conditions. But now, the goal of this presentation is to show how technology and specifically the combination of hardware and software, uh, they can innovate and help in prescribing safe and effective programs. It is clear that uh, technology has uh, made enormous progress in many fields and exercise, uh, training and rehab uh, is no different. Here, uh, you see a picture of innovative solutions called BioCircuit and BioStrength. What are they? BioCircuit is obviously a circuit which is constituted by 12 aerobic machines and uh, aerobic and resistance machines where subjects or patients, so they move from one machine to another according to a predefined path and where on each machine and for each patient, all the machine settings that are the load, the screen, the seat positions, the range of motion, etc., are automatically adjusted to suit patients and program needs. Then, if the equipment is not used within a circuit, but used as a single resistance machine, it is called BioStrength. So BioStrength is a single piece of machine. Now I'll show you a, a video so you have an idea of what BioCircuit is. So what you have seen is something really innovative. But now let's talk a little bit about resistance machines and specifically about the type of resistances that we can generate when we train our muscles. Here we see a very interesting and well done review uh, produced by the group of Robert Newton in Australia. Uh, showing or classifying the type of resistances that you can offer to our muscles into three different categories that are constant resistances, variable and accommodating resistance. So uh, what is a constant resistance? With a constant resistance, which is basically represented by our body weights or by free weights, the resistance itself is mainly influenced by gravity, especially when we lift weights or we lift our body weight. In the case of variable resistance, the resistance itself changes throughout the range of motion. Uh, just for example, on the rubber band, the elastic, the more you pull the elastic, the more resistance you have according to the elasticity module of the, the rubber band. It is the same of pneumatic resistance and in the case of camp lever based machines where the resistance 
depend on the design of this specific pulley, a symmetric pulley, which is called a cam. And then we have the accommodating resistance that depends on a kinematic parameter like velocity in the case of uh, exercising water. It depends on torque in case of isokinetic machines and on acceleration uh, when we have an inertial load to, me, to be uh, moved. Then there are other, let me say, innovative uh, type of resistances. Is the case of viscous resistance, which is very, uh, very particular, very, very strange. How can we get a viscous resistance? So we need to change, actually, the element in which we are moving. For example, if we move an oil that has a greater viscosity than water, we have a greater resistance, which depends essentially on the speed of movement. So the advantage of viscous resistance is that uh, it is very useful both for strength training, because the more you push and the more resistance you have, and also in rehabilitation. Just to make you an example, if it, at a certain point of your range of motion you feel pain, you stop pushing and the resistance gets immediately to zero. Why we are talking now about innovative technology? Because until now, it was not possible to manage all of those resistances all together on a single piece of equipment in an easy and seamless way. And that's why we're here to talk about uh, this technological innovation constituted by the BioStrength machine. Uh, we have seen, be seen before that on those machines, you have something that adjusted automatically. So the seat position, the range of motion, but the heart of the innovation, the heart of the machine is constituted by the engine, the motor, because the, the load, the resistance is provided by a motor, which is electronically controlled. It is clear that those machines can be programmed through a web-based uh, base platform, which is called My Wellness Cloud, to implement the desired exercise program with all the selected resistances we have just seen. So uh, viscose, elastic, uh, isotonic, uh, overloaded eccentric, etc. So basically, a patient can be guided from one machine to another by the screen. And then the patient, she would find, or he would find on the following machine, uh, the chosen resistance, the right load, the right setting, in terms of, of seat position, range of motion, the right duration, etc. So this is really exercise is medicine, which means providing the correct exercise dose. Now let's talk a little bit about the science, because uh, to develop biostrength, we have uh, conducted numerous studies. Uh, we studied uh, eccentric overload, we studied viscous and elastic resistance. Uh, today, I would like uh, to focus uh, on uh, the study that we have executed with Professor Marco Narici at the University of uh, Padova a few months ago. Now, let's talk a little bit about uh, concentric and eccentric contractions. As uh, most of you know, a muscle can develop force during shortening and during lengthening. This is described by uh, what we call the force velocity relationship, which is uh, well known by physiologists. And there is uh, distinct differences in the mechanical output during shortening and lengthening. In fact, as shortening velocity increases, as you can see here on the right hand side, uh, the, there is less time in which myosin can bind to actin resulting in fewer cross bridges being formed. This is why the force decreases with the velocity of shortening. We know that the higher the velocity, the, the less the force that we can generate along the first velocity curve. But when the muscle is lengthening, when the muscle is lengthening, the myosin head behaves in a completely different way from the shortening phase as it is stretched. 
And this is uh, a completely different behavior when we consider a, mu a muscle in a concentric phase versus a muscle in the eccentric phase. Also, another key feature about shortening and lengthening of a muscle is that they differ in terms of energy cost. This concept dates uh, back to early work performed in the UK by Bigland and Woods uh, many years ago. In fact, they developed uh, at that time uh, was a very uh, strange system of bicycle in which in one case, the subject pedal in a normal way here on the left, pushing forward the pedals. And in the opposite bicycle, a, sub a subject was resisting, breaking the concentric action that was the pulling action of the other cycle. And then they measure the oxygen uptake during the two kinds of works. In fact, during the positive and negative work, the behavior was completely different. During positive work, the oxygen uptake was greater, greater, meaning that more energy was consumed as compared to the negative work here in which the subject was breaking and this is true for any given work output. So at any given work output, there's a difference between the negative work and the positive work. So the energy cost of negative work or eccentric, let's call it eccentric, is lower than the concentric one. And in fact, this is also shown and confirmed by the MG activity. If we record the MG activity during positive and negative work, we can see that the EMG for the same level of work output is always lower during negative work as compared to the positive one. More recently, the advantages of negative work have found important clinical applications. And there are many examples of this, but one, for instance, is an application on the elderly to combat frailty. So in this particular study that was published by Lastayo and colleagues, they found that uh, when the subject trained, uh, this was uh, an 11 week uh, strength training study. So when a uh, subject trained using eccentric contraction, there was a much uh, greater increase in strength. And similarly, a greater hypertrophy. So there is strong evidence that eccentric exercise, if performed at the right intensity, activating a high number of motor units can be even more effective than the concentric one. But what does it mean at the correct intensity? Uh, there is a key difficulty with concentric and eccentric training as performed with the uh, conventional strength training machine. And the difficulty is that it is not possible to fully recruit motor units during the eccentric phase. And this is because what is typically done, uh, when you lift a weight, you raise the weight uh, uh, to the maximum displacement, uh, displacement. So once the weight reaches the maximum, in order to lower the same weight, what we have to do is to de-recruit motor units. If we do not do that, the weight will simply stay on the top. So in other words, if we try now to explain this behavior in terms of force velocity relationship, this is what happens. So this, for example, this is a force velocity relationship that exemplifies this condition. So we are lifting a load at a certain velocity concentrically here we are in the concentric uh, phase of movement and we are here on this curve but because the same absolute load is lower we want to come back we want to uh, to do the eccentric contraction we move or we have to move from this velocity curve to another velocity curve and this velocity curve is at a lower level of neural activation, so at, uh, with a lower EMG. If instead we were to use the same force velocity curve, we would have to increase the load. So we, if we want to maintain, to remain into this first velocity curve, and if we want to maintain the same neural activation, theoretically, we should overload the eccentric 
uh, phase of the exercise. So this is the main uh, disadvantage of uh, traditional strength training machines, that in order to lower the weight, we have to de-recruit motor units. Uh, the group of Professor Narici, uh, with the group, because we participated in this study, so we tried to overcome the, the limitations found in conventional uh, strength training machines a few years ago, when we performed a study using a Technogym strength training machine, but in which we applied an electric winch that you can see here in red. So we had two group of uh, elderly subjects. One group trained conventionally, so lifting and lowering uh, the load using a leg press machine. And the other group was doing only the eccentric load. We could do so because the electrical winch, so this device, was doing the concentric phase. So the winch was lifting the weight. So the load was lifted by the electric winch, and then the subject performed only the eccentric phase. And the results were uh, clearly demonstrating that the eccentric training only was uh, uh, much superior when compared to the conventional training. We measure the muscle architecture in terms of uh, fascicle length or in terms of a penation angle, as shown here. So this is a, a typical ultrasound image showing the length of the, the fascicle. And this is the penation angle. Uh, and the penation and the length of the, of the fascicle are two parameters that are very, very sensitive to muscle hypertrophy, and they change very rapidly. Also, we measure muscle thickness in the human vastus uh, lateralis uh, muscles. So we say, we said that uh, a key difficulty with eccentric training as performed with conventional strength training machine is that it is not possible to easily overload the negative part of the contraction. So with BioStrength, this is the one of the machine uh, along the BioStrength uh, equipment, just one of the 12 machines. So with this leg press, we had the opportunity of applying in a recent study, uh, the level of neural drive during exercise performed using overloading as afforded uh, with this new training machine. So what have we done? We were able to overload the muscles during the eccentric phase as compared with the conventional type of uh, training. Uh, the study will be uh, shortly published into the European Journal of Applied uh, Physiology. During the eccentric phase, the load was 1.5 fold higher than the concentric one. And these are the results obtained both for the 70% of one repetition maximum and the 80% of one repetition maximum. Effectively, you can see that, so this is the EMG activity normalized to the concentric condition in, in this case, showing here in the vertical axis. So when you perform the concentric eccentric ex exercise, so the conventional uh, exercise with the same uh, load, in other words, with the same load between the concentric and the eccentric phase, you can see that EMG activity in the eccentric phase is much lower. So, during the eccentric phase, you have to lower, you lower the EMG, you lower your neural activation. Whereas, when we perform the same concentric eccentric movement, but using the potentiated eccentric phase, you can see that DMG activity of the eccentric phase was the same as that of the concentric phase. So there was not a de-recruitment recruitment of motor units. And this was true for both the 70% one RAM and the 80% of one repetition maximum. So in other words, using this combination of the 1.5 fold greater eccentric load, we were able not to lower the activation, but we were able to fully exploit the first 
velocity curve. So we, we therefore, we are able to train along this first velocity curve, reaching this level of neural activation during the eccentric phase, obviously. So both the concentric and the eccentric phase were performed at the same level of neural activation with no de recruitment of motor units. Uh, so I've just presented one of the research areas we have done on biostrength, and uh, we have obviously studied viscous, elastic resistances, uh, uh, the reduction of eccentric also, the effect on the reduction and not only of the increment of the eccentric contraction. But again, the beauty of this new technology is that it becomes very easy to manipulate all of those contractions. So since now it was not possible to move from viscous to eccentric to elastic to overloaded eccentric uh, standard isotonic on a single piece of uh, equipment. And all of those uh, contraction or all of those resistances can be managed through a software and the health professional, the physicians, the physiotherapists, they can prescribe the correct type of, uh, of resistance. They think it is correct for a particular patient for a particular uh, condition. Angela. Thank you, Silvano. I think I'm beginning to understand this a little bit better. Um, this is very fascinating to see the different types of um, resistance that can be applied and how you can increase the recruitment to make the eccentric part equal the um, concentric activation and energy cost. So as, as I'm seeing this, first of all, let me look at it from a clinician's point of view as to what I see the advantages of. And then maybe you can tell me what some more of the advantages are that, that I may have missed so far because I find this whole concept really very, very exciting. So first of all, if I, as a physician, want a patient or a client to be doing a particular um, type of exercise, for example, they have an Achilles tendon problem, and I want them to be working the Achilles tendon in a way that is especially going to help the tendinopathy with eccentric loading. So I could potentially prescribe a type of exercise that will give a high eccentric load, and can I make it be where there is no eccentric load, or is it just a lower, sorry, a, that there is no concentric load, or is there some concentric load? In other words, so actually I don't know if you, you have a machine that will work for ankles, do you? Can something do ankles for Achilles? Yeah, you can do. This is exactly what you can do, as, as you mentioned before. You can manage the load. Uh, imagine that you are lifting 50 kilograms during plantar flexion, for example, or during a leg press, a standard leg press. You can use the same uh, 50 kilograms on both the concentric phase and the eccentric phase, or you can manipulate the load. You can decrease the eccentric, or you can increase the eccentric load. Uh, at a given percentage that you uh, decide to use. It is well known in um, rehab literature that uh, uh, playing with an overloaded eccentric uh, load seems to be very useful in some uh, tendinopathy conditions. So these machines allows you to do it in a very easy way. This is, at the end of the day, eccentric is not completely new. It is known since uh, ages, I would say. But the beauty of the technology is the possibility of easily applying the, uh, the contraction on the machine and moving from a contraction, moving from a resistance to another. You can move from the eccentric to the elastic to the passive, for example. So if I wanted to have someone say they have a patellar tendinopathy, maybe that's an even easier and more common problem for some. Um, I could send someone who's going to be using this equipment, I could say, I want to have almost no concentric load, and I want to have a certain amount of eccentric load. I could do that using these machines, it sounds. Exactly, exactly. So, so I don't have to have 
a physical person lifting the load and then the patient just lowers the load, I can just have this done on a machine. This is what the machine does uh, autonomously. You program the machine to provide a high eccentric that could be 20%, 30%, 50%, whatever, and then the machine does it alone. <laughs> and so the, the programming is done by the exercise professional. In other words, how, how does the information get to the thing that the patient is then going to log in with their thumb or with their watch or their whatever? Um, how do you get the information from the exercise professional to the machine? Okay, so uh, obviously to program the machine, they need to know a little bit of physiology and uh, evidence-based medicine. So they need to uh, personally play with the machine. But there is another possibility, which is that of using uh, the program that you have mentioned at the beginning of this webinar. So we have collected, in collaboration with the ACSM, a number of uh, evidence-based programs, which means uh, uh, programs that have been shown, exercise programs that have been shown to be uh, effective in particular conditions. So we have uh, put all of those programs in our platform and then just by clicking a button, so selecting, for example, the, the study conducted by Dr. Balducci on type 2 diabetic uh, subjects, you just apply that exercise intervention across the machines. Huh. Huh. So, in other words, um, the exercise professional can take the information from the booklet, which will be available very, very soon, and take that information and put it directly into how the machine is going to be running for that patient? Exactly. Am I understanding that right? Huh. Exactly. Based on a test, obviously, because the loads are based on a test that you, you need to do in advance, because the loads are not absolute load, but are percentages of the one repetition maximum. And the range of motion is uh, subjective. So you need to do a one RM test and you need to measure the range of motion. And then the seats uh, of the, let me say, the setting of the machine. So every time the patient gets into a machine, the auto machine automatically adjusts all the parameters that are the seat position, the range of motion, the load, the speed of execution, etc according to what the, the health professional have uh, uh, has prescribed in advance. That's too remarkable. So in other words, so say I'm now the patient yeah. and my doctor has said, you um, need to be doing more exercise in general. So I'm going to send you to do this circuit because I want you to become stronger and um, I want you to become faster at doing certain types of things maybe. Maybe I want you to be a faster cyclist. Um, so I'm now going to take this prescription to a gym that has this type of equipment and there will be an exercise professional there who can help me with programming this in. So once the exercise professional has done the program and say I have a, a special watch or something, what, what do I physically do to go through these things? In other words, do I just put my watch against the machine and it will automatically adjust the position of the feet, the position of the back, and so forth? First of all, does it do all of that? Yeah, so uh, you have two options. Option number one is that the exercise professional uh, uh, has selected uh, one of those programs. So, uh, he selects, he, if he selects a program and assign to you a program, as soon as you log in into the machine, you can log in with your mobile or we have some bracelets or other, other tools. The machine recognizes you and automatically set up uh, to, okay. to, to provide you the correct uh, exercise prescription. This is option number one. Option number two is that the exercise professional is so advanced that he creates or, on his own the program. You have to consider also that the machines are so innovative that uh, the literature we have reviewed was not considering all the possibilities that the machines allow now. 
for example, the viscous mm -hmm. resistance or the combination of uh, elastic and then viscous, etc. So there is not literature on that. So you can even do something new. And uh, we are sure that we will provide, we will create a lot of new science based on this uh, technology. That Because now it's, it's really very easy to perform new resistances. And at the same time, it's very easy to collect data because every time you train on the, on the system, everything you do is recorded into our platform. So it becomes very easy to do evidence-based studies. Because you can mm -hmm. collect an incredible amount of data. So Technogem will then have access to all the data that is being used from its machines. Exactly. It's not Technogem because for pri uh, privacy reasons, we cannot look at the data of our patient, but it's the owner of the medical facility. Ah, okay. We can okay. And then a, a name with, uh, with values, with, with numbers. By so law. then is is the gem doing what we call de-identifying the data and then sending the, the gem or the facility, medical facility, whatever it is, they're de-identifying the data and sending it on to you? Uh, exactly. All the facility itself can, uh, can manage the data, uh, de-identify it. Or in case of medical uh, research, medical study, if the patient gives informed consent, it's, it's, another, it's another story. Okay. And... Um, in the U.S. and probably, well, I know in Europe um, as well, we have many of the electronic medical records that are um, that are holding all the data for an individual. So I know that there is work to try to make this integration seamless. But right now, what what do people do where you are, for example? to get that information back into the medical record? Is, is there a way to put some sort of summary data in or does the, the exercise professional um, himself or herself have to summarize those data and then just send them back to the healthcare provider? You know, we, are, we are working on that because it's, very, it's a very interesting feature. Consider that normally on the electronic medical records, uh, you don't need or they don't need uh, to fully exploit all the data. They would be too much. They would just need uh, a summary of what the patients have done. For example, meds per hour per week, just the volume. Whilst the specific data will remain, the full exploit, exploit data will remain in our platform. Whilst we can work with different electronic medical records to share the summary of the data. Okay. And so then if we look at the whole picture for the patient or client, in say in the electronic medical record that I've used the most, there's something produced called an after visit summary. So we could put in the exercises medicine um, guide for how the person should increase the activity in the after visit summary. We could also then put something that is going to the exercise professional that says this is what we want, but of course you as a professional may be adding certain parts to it, and then the exercise professional will send us back the summary of what's happened so we can enter it into the electronic medical record. Is that kind of how you're doing it right now, or do you work it a different way? We are, we are working on that. We are working on that. Consider that there are different electronic medical records platforms, so you cannot develop a solution which is good for all the platform. So we need to work yeah. different ways. But this is what we are doing, what the, let me say, the community is asking for. Right, so one, one more area had to do with safety. And you touched on this, that with certain types of resistances, the second that the person stops doing the activity, the resistance goes to zero, for example. Yeah. Um, is that true on these biocircuit machines that you were just showing us that have concentric and eccentric resistance? Um, or is that just true on the viscous and elastic resistances? Yeah, it doesn't happen with the, the eccentric and it doesn't happen with the elastic, but it does happen with the viscous. Because if you lift a weight, if you do eccentric, you're simulating a weight. And if you feel pain, you, you still have this weight on your joints. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you use the viscous resistance, uh, the beauty of the viscous is that 
the, the load you have on your joint depends on the velocity you are using. So the more you push, the higher the resistance, which is okay. good for developing strength. On the other end, if you feel pain, if you start, uh, if you move from pushing 200 kilos to zero kilo, you have immediately zero kilos into your joint at any point throughout the range of motion. So this is very safe for uh, rehabilitation purposes. Now, you also briefly mentioned something called spotter mode, and that also would seem to be a, a real safety, um, whatever the right word is, uh, something that's going to promote safety for the patient. So which types of machine does the spotter mode work on? Because this is basically like having a person there stopping the motion right away. Yeah, every, every machine has a spotter function. And it's a function that you can uh, use or not. Again, it depends on you. It depends on the health professional. And uh, a sport mean, mean having a friend, <laughs> a mate that helps you when you are in trouble. So the machines, the electronic control of the machine, realize that you are decreasing, let me say, dramatically your speed. So he's realizing, he realizes that say, you are in trouble. So it decreases the load by 15, 20%, it depends, and helps you in completing the, the repetition. Is that present all the time, or is that something that the exercise professional needs to enable, uh, or the person to, needs? needs to enable? That. Okay. Okay, let me um, take a, a quick look. I think this is, is really fascinating that, um, how you can use the eccentric load in a better way, because we obviously know that eccentric loading is very helpful in many conditions, how you can provide safety for really everyone, because everyone needs some of these safety interventions, and how we can then begin to get the information from the exercise professional back to the healthcare professional as is appropriate. So this this sounds like a really thrilling set of, of machinery that is moving forward. I mean, it's certainly not static. You're always looking for some better and newer methodologies. Um, what kinds of questions do you have for the clinical side of things? Or have we kind of covered them all? <laughs> we have covered a lot. Obviously, the clinical uh, colleagues, they need to know more about uh, the benefit of exercise. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure, uh, talking a lot with them, what they want is, uh, is of being safe. What, what they want is to have their patients to be sent to an exercise professional, and they would like to have the, uh, the, the mental, let me say, serenity, the mental uh, Calm, calmness to, to know that the health professional is well prepared. Uh, so what we are trying to do is to help the health professional with excellent technology, which is all the contraction I war, uh, was mentioning now on the machine, and also with the pre-programmed program in order to give, uh, uh, let me say, a vast possibility of a pre-made program in order to simply select a program that works. That will make the, the, the clinician very comfortable. That's, that's fantastic. In addition to providing the safety interventions, you are doing everything you can to make it easy for the clinician to prescribe appropriately, the exercise professional to carry this out, and then communicate the data back. And I think the booklet that you um, are producing that really shows all of the evidence that works for the different chronic conditions based on different types of equipment will prove very, very helpful in this. Now, of course, that booklet is, as you say, looking at exercise that's done on currently available equipment, and you all are always innovating. Yeah, obviously we will send a link to all the, uh, the webinar participants on how to download the booklet in PDF. So with a simple click, they, they will have the possibility of reviewing all the programs we have listed and uh, make available within the BioStrand machines. That sounds perfect. Well, Silvano, I thank you very, very much for 
you and for your company, first of all, helping ACSM really move exercises medicine initiatives forward. Um, the funding has been a great partnership, but the science is really remarkable. So I appreciate your taking your time to explain some of this to our members and to the non-members who are also part of this virtual experience. And um, thanks very much for this great report showing how these interventions have made a big difference in your area. So I think we all need to come visit Chesena and um, see what you are doing there. But um, we really look forward to you being a part of our actual meeting, we hope next year, so that we can um, see some of this equipment in motion. And until then, we can be using it and trying it out in our local facilities. So thank you again. Thank you for hosting us. And I, I invite everybody to come to visit our headquarters in Chazena so you can have an idea of the labs we have, the technology and, and the science we do behind the product development. Great. Thanks again. Bye-bye. And ciao to everybody.